the people that came before us are not our masters. They're our teachers. They're our guides. But if I find a new way to proceed that is better, I'll do it because, you know, the truth, he says, is open to all and, and it will be uncovered by future generations. Twice in a year. What a treat. I know. <laughs> Well, you know, it's the pandemic. It's easier to get people stuck at home. <laughs> That's true. Well, we've got nothing else to do. We might as well just keep on talking about stoicism. The stoic, That's right. the stoic guide to a happy life. 53 brief, brief lessons for living. Why do you write this? For two reasons. Uh, on the one hand, there's kind of a personal reason. Uh, the, the book is really a ambitious, uh, to some extent, rewriting of the Enchiridion, which is one of the classic texts in stoicism in ancient stoicism and and, and in its uh, it wasn't written by epictetus uh, but it uh, uh, it is about epictetus teaching epictetus didn't write anything um and uh, one of his best students or most famous student arian and nicomedia uh, write, wrote down both the discourses and the uh, encaridian to some extent this is my personal homage to epictetus because he has been my steady guide throughout my Stoic path. Um, you know, I love all of the Stoics. I read Marcus Aurelius. I, I read Seneca. I read some of the so-called minor Stoics that are not really minor. They're just minor because we don't have a hell of a lot uh, that survived of his of, of their writings. But Epictetus has been the one that really got me into it, and it has been sort of a constant companion. So, to one ex to, in some in one sense, it is just a, my personal homage to Epictetus. But more importantly, it is an attempt to update Stoicism, and in particular, Epictetus' version of Stoicism to the 21st century. And the reason for that is that Stoicism, in a sense, got interrupted. Uh, you know, it, it started out in um, uh, the late 4th century BCE. It flourished for five or six centuries until the early 3rd century of the modern era. And then it kind of got interrupted by Christianity, just like every other, uh, you know, Hellenistic philosophy, just like it, it, it disappeared from, from view. And in that sense, the Greek-Roman Greek philosophies are very different from, let's say, a number of Eastern traditions, such as Buddhism or Confucianism or Taoism, which evolved and developed gradually over time in essentially uninterrupted fashion. So, for instance, if you compare Stoicism with Buddhism, today it's not even correct really to talk about Buddhism in the singular. There are, there are many Buddhisms, right, because there's a number of traditions that evolved over continuously over two and a half millennia. And clearly nobody today is a Buddhist in the same sense in which somebody was a Buddhist 2000 and, you know, and a half uh, you know, years ago. But that's not true for Stoicism because it's like after the third, the, the, the second or third century, it's like we, we have a lot of influence of Stoicism on other thinkers like uh, Christian writers throughout the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and you know, early modern philosophers. But then we kind of have a jump to the 20th century, essentially. And so um, uh, I'm not the first one to do this kind of thing. thing my friend and um, colleague uh, Larry Baker, who wrote A New Stoicism, uh, did a similar thing uh, with the entire Stoic system. Uh, however, Larry, Larry's attempt is, on the one hand, more comprehensive than mine, because he didn't focus just on Epictetus. He just, like, did the whole thing. But it's also much more difficult uh, in terms of, you know, it's not as accessible to the general public, because... He wrote for philosophers for for you know in a technical fashion. If you don't have at least a couple of courses on, of logic under your belly, you're not going to get much out of that book. Um, so so my attempt has been to update Stoicism to the 21st century, but also to make Epictetus accessible again uh, to a wider public. Because you know most people I bet today don't haven't heard the term the the, the word Epic, you know the, the name of Epictetus. It's like uh, who the hell was this guy? People have heard Plato. People have heard Socrates. They've heard Marcus Aurelius. They might not have read them, but they've heard of them. Epictetus, like Epi, Epi, who? Uh, and uh, this is unfortunate. And it's also rather anomalous. It is a, like a 20th century, early 21st century feature, because before that, Epictetus was actually a household name. His school in Nicopolis in northwestern Greece was very famous throughout, throughout antiquity. You know, the emperor Adrian uh, went to visit, you know, a lot of, uh, of um, sort of, High-level Roman aristocrats sent their kids to uh, study with him, that sort of stuff. Then throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance, the Enchiridion was actually rewritten and updated several times because it was used as a, trinal, uh, as a, a training manual for – trinal is a new word that I just invented – a nice. training manual <laughs> for uh, Christian monks. Right? So it was actually adopted by Christianity. 
And then all the way to, into sort of very recent, relatively recent times, like many of the uh, American founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, uh, as well as several major British figures, early modern British figures, such as David Hume and, and Adam Smith, they all had copies of the Enchiridion. They, know, they all knew about Epictetus, whether they considered themselves Stoics or not. Uh, they certainly had read him. So, and so I think it is unfortunate that a lot of people today don't even know who Epictetus was. I think his, his philosophy, with or without my update, is, is incredible and it needs to be you know, uh, understood and, and appreciated because it changes lives like it changed mine. What's so special about him? Well, he's a no-nonsense kind of philosopher. He talks very in a very plain plain language he talks about important topics uh anything from from wealth to friendship to death to you know what are the important things in life in fact he even actually gives you advice on uh what kind of conversation to engage in and whether to watch chariot uh, races or not <laughs> should we should we watch chariot races no we shouldn't watch chariot races really it's okay. like it's a it's a waste of time uh, That's unfortunately a shame. there are not many of those <laughs> yeah i know i love <laughs> i just want to see a, a, a boudicca you know, I want to I want to see some some horses and some lions and tigers getting at it. <laughs> yeah, that would be kind of interesting, wouldn't it? So, so he's both straightforward and a, approaches a number of topics that are really about con, uh, concern for for everyday life. He also has a wicked sense of humor, uh, bordering on sarcasm. Uh, you know, he's he's. By modern standards, he's a little bit abusive of some of his students, right? <laughs> he, he calls them slaves, <laughs> which he would know because he actually was a slave. You know, he studied out his life in Hierapolis in Western Turkey, modern Western Turkey, as a slave. In fact, he, we don't even know his real name. Epictetus just means acquired in Greek. Wow. So it literally means that he was a slave, right? So I only, um, I only learned recently that Plato wasn't. Plato's real name that it was that's right. Ar Aristocles. That's right. Apparently, uh, apparently, we don't know for sure, but yes. Yeah, and yeah, Plato, Plato just means broad shouldered. Yeah, because he was a wrestler. Ah, now if you if you Google it, there yeah. was three um three suggestions for why he was called Plato. Plato is the broad. Um, yeah. first one is the breadth of his shoulders. Um, potentially because of all of the weight training he'd done through wrestling, uh, in right. the gymnasia. Um, yep. The uh, second one is the breadth of his skills, again, for, uh, going from the physical attributes. But the third oh. one is the size of his forehead. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Uh, I'll go with the first two, which are, which are not actually mutually exclusive, right? One, one can have both broad shoulders and a broad understanding. Of and things. a broad forehead. And a broad forehead, yes, absolutely. It could be all of the above. Right. But the difference being that a broad forehead is not the result of your efforts. On the other hand, the other two really are, actually are, right? <laughs> I get it. So Epictetus, why is he so cool? Well, he's cool because he gives you very practical advice on life. Um, for instance, if you, if you pick up the first, the very opening of the Enchiridion, uh, it says some things are up to us, other things are not up to us. And then he gives uh, two lists of things that are and are not un under our power. And if you actually, if, if you get anything out of the Enchiridion or of, of the field guide, uh, the, new, the new version, that would be it. If you just get that one and incorporate it into your daily life, that's just, just that one is going to change things for you. Because uh, it turns out that what it does, if you really understand the, the so-called dichotomy, this is a, a referred to as the dichotomy of control. If you understand the dichotomy of control and incorporate it in your life and you know, internalize it, because understanding it's easy. Sure, some things are up to me, other things are not up to me. Right, okay. Then we can, have, we, have, we can have a discussion about what falls into each category, and actually we should have that discussion because it, it is important. But understanding is not, it's not enough. You have to internalize it. You have to actually live it. And if you do, what that does is it results into a major reorientation of the way you conduct your life. Because it turns out that Epictetus says that the only things, the things that are up to us are actually very limited. There's essentially three categories of things that are up to us. Our considered judgments, our uh, endorsed values, and our decisions to act or not to act. That's it. Nothing else. Right? So not even most of your mental life is under your control, as we know. You know there's this all sorts of thoughts that pop up to, in our mind, and we can't control them. We don't even want to control them necessarily. Right? But those three things are the ones you control. The rest, you don't. You can influence it, of course, in some cases. 
but you don't control it. Don't you control the, out, the, the, the outcome? For instance, we're talking, we're having this conversation in the middle of a pandemic, right? So let's talk about health. Health is one of the things that Epictetus says is not under your control. And a lot of people find that rather counterintuitive. It's like, what do you mean? I, I can go to the gym. I can, uh, you know, exercise. I can have a healthy diet. Now that I'm in the COVID, I can, uh, you know, wear a mask when I go out, uh, social distance, avoid crowds, uh, wipe down my groceries and you know, sanitize my hands, all that sort of stuff, right? And you should do that. In fact, all of those things are under your control because those are your decisions to act and not to act based on your judgments, right? However, I'm a biologist, I can tell you. Viruses are sons of bitches. They, they will get you, they might get you even if you do everything right, right? It's, it's down to luck. Yes, you can influence that outcome, meaning that if you do everything right, you're less likely probably far less likely to contract the virus, but you may, right? All it takes is I go to a grocery, I have to go to grocery shopping because I have to eat. And all it takes is somebody not wearing their mask, sneezing, uh, you know, a, a foot away from me and that's it. <laughs> then then, then I, I got it, right? So if we understand this, then what happens is that you start worrying much less about outcomes because they're not under your control. Not because they're not important. It is important whether I get sick or not from, from COVID, right? Um, but it's not under my control, so why the hell am I worried about it? There's no, it's a waste of energy. It's a waste of, of mental energy and emotional energy. I should focus, on the other hand, where my agency is maximized, where I can actually make a difference right? in the, the kinds of judgments and decisions that I was talking about. If you do that for everything, in your life, because if it is says you should do that on anything, no matter, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's important or not, large or small, et cetera, et cetera. He says your life will change dramatically and you will be happy. You would not complain. You would not be angry with people and you would not be angry at, at uh, circumstances like, okay, I sign up. <laughs> I, I like that sort of stuff. And it works. It does take practice, obviously. Uh, as I said, one thing is to understand the, 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 the idea. Another thing is to actually internalize it. It takes a little bit of practice. But I can, I can tell you, it started making a difference in my life within weeks after I started practicing stoicism. And now it's kind of second nature. That was something that I really enjoyed during our first conversation, which everyone can go back and listen to from earlier this year if you enjoy this conversation, um, was talking about the automation of it. Um, in the yeah. same way as people automate the uh, other things in their life, a little trigger that reminds them to go outside, the trigger for the dichotomy of control. It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to internalize it. And then it's a third thing to automate it. And that gap between understanding how to do it and what it is, and then the um, removal of it being so arduous that it takes tons and tons of effort, uh, is another step, right? And that's just right. repetition over time. It is just repetition, just like a lot of other things. You know, if you if you want to learn how to drive a car or play an instrument or, you know, anything, uh, it, repetition is the key. You have to understand what you're doing. I mean, you have to, to have a sort of a cognitive understanding of, you know, why is it that you want to hit the brake, let's say, if a pedestrian walks in front of you all of a sudden. Uh, but understanding by itself doesn't bring your ability to actually drive the car well or yeah. play the instrument well or do whatever. <laughs> Precisely. What is a vade mecum? But a vade mecum is a Latin Did I pronounce it correctly? Definitely. Yes, yes, you did. Yes. Uh, vade mecum just means um, bring it with you or carry it with you. And that so is the, the reason that you make a a book into something that's small and that is with exactly. you at all times. And exactly. yeah, that's cool. I really like that. Vade mecum. I'm going to, and it's, is it go with you, did you say? Yeah, it comes with me, literally. Cool. So what are your favorite lessons? You've, you, like you say, not a small um, undertaking to try and do Stoicism 2.0. <laughs> Before we get on to where you diverged and where you amended work, what were some of the lessons, your favorite lessons, that didn't require any modification from the original text? Well, let's see. We can open some kind of a random. Like the first one I just told you, the number number one, right? Um, number 11, I think it's particularly uh, interesting. It says, it starts out, my version starts out, you should go through life as a traveler who stops at an inn, never regarding anything as truly yours, but as on loan from the universe. And then it continues for a couple of other paragraphs. And that's a notion that you find in Epictetus, and in fact, you actually find in earlier Stoics like Seneca, 
this idea that we don't actually own anything. We, we use a language of ownership for a lot of things. My house, my wife, my friend, my this and that or the other, right? But in fact, you don't own anything. Even if you legally own your house, it's not really yours. Meaning that somebody probably lived in it before you did and somebody's going to live in it after you, 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 you're, go, you're done with it. Even if it's a new house, at some point somebody else will inherit it or somebody else will, will, will buy it. It's not something you can carry with you into the, into, under the grave, right? And of course, even so, more so for uh, things like relationships, right? I mean, nobody is actually your, no human being is yours. You have a relationship with them. And the relationship, relationships change uh, over time. Uh, sometimes they end. Um, and they are, however, an important part of life. So what Epictetus is saying there is like, hold on to everything as if you were a traveler in a hotel, Right. When you check in your hotel, uh, the room that you're given is your room, quote unquote, right? Not as in I own it <laughs> and that's it. I can do whatever I want, I, I want with it. I can trash it. I can you know, do, do, do whatever I like. No, I don't. I can't. But it is my room. Nobody else is going to get into it uh, you know, unless I give permission for the duration of my stay. Now, what is the proper way to stay at a hotel? You use everything you have available, but you don't trash the place. You leave it as you know, clean and orderly as you found it, even better, actually, ideally, and so on and so forth, right? I've and never so because... left a hotel room better than I found it, Massimo. That, <laughs> if that's the way that you, that might be your cultural heritage speaking for you there, but us Brits are nowhere near as polite and tidy as that. Granted, that's not an, a normal thing, but you, you see what I mean? You certainly wouldn't trash it, right? That's the, 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 the notion is. So the idea is that that's the attitude that you should that you should have for pretty much everything in life. Just hold it lightly. Remember that it's not yours. It's on loan from the universe, and the universe can take that loan back at any time. Wasn't there a um, a little further down the line of that particular thinking, wasn't there a place that you diverge from the work, the original text, whereby um, you had a, a problem with the way that describing dealing with the death of a family member uh, was basically yes. to be treated with e equanimity. It was like, it doesn't matter. Like, you shouldn't cry if your wife or your son or your daughter dies. You shouldn't cry if this happens. And I think that you said that kind of, f we forget, or that is ignorant of the way that interpersonal relationships work. Is that right? Yeah. So so what Epictetus says, that's, that's actually one of the major places where I diverge from Epictetus. And I diverge with respect and understanding uh not because i thought he was an i think he was an it was an idiot it's like oh look at the kind of stuff that he was believing so let me set the stage first the stoics uh believed in uh a type of providence which is not like the christian providence you know christian providence is based on the notion that there is a creator god that loves us and cares about us and has a plan for the universe that's not what we're talking about however the stoics believed that the universe itself which they called god or nature interchangeably uh, is a living organism endowed with logos. Logos is the ability to reason. Okay, so it's it's its own organ. It's it's a thing. It's this gigantic organism that does its own thing. We don't know what what exactly it does, but it does its own thing. We are literally bits and pieces of that organism. Okay, uh, like like cells in the organism or or organs in the organism. In fact, Epictetus uses a metaphor that I find beautiful. He says, um, you know, imagine you are the a foot that has to step into the mud. If you think of it from the point of view of just the foot, without realizing you're connected to a whole organism, you say, well, this is disgusting. I don't want to step into the mud. What the hell? You know, I'd rather take a shower. I'd, take, I'd rather have a bath. Or, you know, I, don't, I don't want the, mat, the mud. But if you understand that you are, in fact, connected to a body, the body has to get home, and the only way to get home is to cross a muddy path, then not only are you going to do it because it's your duty, but you're going to be happy to do it. Because you're fulfilling, you're literally fulfilling your, the, reason, your, the reason for your existence. You're allowing the body to get home, right? If you believe in that kind of conception of the universe, then it follows, as Epictetus says, that um, when something tragic happens to us or something that other people think tragic, not only we should endure it and accept it, we should actually be happy about it, right? It's, well, it's the concept of amor fati, love your fate although the phrase comes from Nietzsche much later on, and he was not a stoic. 
but that's essentially the idea, right? So when he says in the original Enchiridion, look, uh, remember when you kiss your child or, or your wife, remember that they're mortal. They're, therefore, if they die, you will not be disturbed. People read this passage out of context, like, what kind of a monster is this guy? <laughs> it's like, what Some do you mean? psychopathic be... yeah, it's a sage from, right? from back in the, in the, the right. ancient times, yeah. Right. But they don't understand that if in, if in context, that Epictetus is absolutely right. This is no different, in fact, from a Christian who really believes that his now deceased uh, you know, father or mother or loved one is in heaven. He should be happy. I never understood. You know, I grew up Catholic. And I never understood, even when I was a Catholic, why is it that so many people who profess to profess to be Christian go to funerals of their own loved ones and cry in, des- in, in desperation? It's like, so you think the guy is in hell? Because that could be the only, the only reason why you would be in desperation. But if you actually think that he's in a better place, that he's with God, in the presence of God and all that, so you shouldn't, not only you shouldn't be upset, you should actually celebrate. You know, funerals should be parties. It's like, all right. And I'm coming, you know, I'm, I'll join you in a few, in a little bit of time. And like, compared to eternity, even if you live a long time uh, as a human being, it's laughing. So it's like, okay, great, let's celebrate. But they don't. And I suspect that they don't because a lot of people don't actually believe deep down what, they, what they're saying. Is but another, that's a different... to, to, to interject there, obviously your background, which a lot of the listeners might not know, is actually evolutionary biology, right? That's what that's you, right. Yes. you spent a lot yeah, of time my... doing. Um, yeah. There is... Our, genetics are one hell of a drug and our genetic predispositions are capable of overpowering pretty much anything i think and that includes faith like yes, the, the 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 inherent um horror that we feel when a loved one passes away is like gravity it's that yeah. strong you know and sure. to believe obviously the stoics weren't privy to the work of the evolutionary theory um but i think you are right to highlight the fact that it's just it's inherently unrealistic to expect humans to be able to transcend their own nature because of some clever cerebral trick that we've taught ourselves oh well don't forget about the dichotomy of control like my daughter was 11 years old and the light of my life like what do you expect this person to do yeah exactly so it is not only impossible in practice it's also not tenable in theory anymore because today you know move 18 centuries forward from epictetus uh, look at modern biology and modern physics and there is no reason to think that the universe is anything like what the stoics thought it was it's not a living organism endowed with reason it is a set of dynamic processes regulated by what we call the laws of nature and yes, we are bits and pieces of the universe, but not in any sense that we are functional bits and pieces. We're not like the foot in the, in the, in the organism. We're just there. <laughs> and the universe doesn't care one way or the other. What happens to us is irrelevant to the rest of the universe. It's not like it's, we're causally connected in a very loose way. But it's not that nothing like that could provide you something like stoic providence, which means, I argue in the field guide uh, to a happy life, that we should do away with amor fati. But this notion uh, that I should love my fate, no matter what it is, is non-tenable anymore. I understand and I respect why it was tenable in Epictetus' time. Uh, that was a beautiful notion of providence that they have. But I can't buy into that notion of providence, so it's got to go. Now, if you suggest that, and immediately somebody says, oh, but then you give up stoicism. It's like, well, no, hold on. Uh, first of all, uh, in the introduction to the book, I explain that uh, change within the Stoic system is nothing new. Even the ancient Stoics themselves constantly debated about what stays and what goes. Right? Um, Cleanthus, the second head of the Stoa, disagreed with Zeno, the first head of the Stoa. Chrysippus, the third head of the Stoa, disagreed with both Zeno and Cleanthus. Seneca uh, actually writes explicitly, it's like, look, he, he writes a, a beautiful letter to his friend Lucilius, and he says, uh, look, my friend, the people that came before us are not our masters, they are our teachers. There are guides, but if I find a new way to proceed that is better, I'll do it because, you know, the truth, he says, is open to all and, and it will be uncovered by future generations. So, so this notion that Stoicism is like it's this thing that was stable over time for five centuries and then all of a sudden, you know, who the hell are you to change it? Like, no, that's, that's fantasy. Uh, it has never been stable. 
that said, of course, there is only a certain amount of change you do, you can do, and then still call it stoicism. I mean, to some extent, it doesn't matter what we call it, right? Because names are names, labels are labels. Um, but I am sensitive to this notion that, you know, if you change too much, and especially if you change too much without readjusting the bits and pieces of the system, with, without seeking coherence within the system, then then you're open to the uh, to the accusation, I suppose, that it's not stoicism anymore. That's why I do it very carefully. You, you notice that at the end of the, of the book, there is an actual, actual detailed table, and there is a, a, a section which I describe bit by bit all the changes that, that I made and why they were made and how they fit into the general system. So one of the reasons this is still Stoicism is, in my mind, uh, well, there's two reasons. First of all, because the Stoics insisted that the three parts of philosophy, ethics, which is about how to live your life, metaphysics, they call it physics, but metaphysics, that under, your understanding of how the universe works, and logic, meaning your, your ability to reason, they have to go together. Because if you, are, if you don't reason correctly about things, you're likely to mislead your life. Your ethics isn't going to work very well. And if you are under deep misunderstandings about how the u- universe work, works, that also implies that you're going to likely mislead your life. Right? So the three things are connected. If I change the metaphysics, in this case, I'm, I'm suggesting a change in the metaphysics. Right? Do away with the notion that the universe is a living organism endowed with reason. Then you have to change the ethics, which is what I do. You, you throw, out, throw out the amor fati, and you retain what? Well, you still retain uh, notions that come out of the dichotomy of control. You still retain this idea that, okay, maybe I'm not going to love my fate, but I can, pr- I can prepare myself mentally to deal with things that are inevitable and accept them as for what, for what they are and still try to get the best out of life as it actually happens to, to me and not as I would like it to, to be, right? So not engaging in wishful thinking. So you're still using, uh, adopting a stoic attitude. You're still adopting a lot of stoic metaphysics because stoic metaphysics includes determinism. That these, were, these people were compatibilist, as they, we, we would say today about free will. Uh, these people were determined, uh, were uh, believed in universal cause and effect. We still do, That's modern science, essentially is based on the notion that uh, there's universal cause and effect. And they were materialists, meaning that they believe that the only things that exist are, are physical stuff. It's, it's not, we today would say matter and energy, of course, but stuff, not, you know, there's no transcendental thing. There is no immaterial in, 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 in thing. There is nothing out there um, that along those lines. Those are still true as far as I can tell. And, and so that's why you, you st- we're still retaining much of the stoic system but we're making some changes i like it how do you think the stoics would define a happy life obviously this is the stoic guide to a happy life we need to define our terms what is a yes. happy life yeah the, the word happiness of course is fraught with problems because people have different very very different ideas about what counts as a happy life right in fact the word happiness itself uh can take a number of of, uh, of meanings on the one hand, for instance, I can say, oh, I'm happy that tonight I get to uh, relax with my wife and watch a movie. Sure, but that's not the happiness that we're talking about here. It, it, the, the word applies, but not in the broader sense. In a broader sense, happiness could be a life of flourishing, right? a life where you get to enjoy the good things about it. Your, your amount of pain and suffering is reduced to a minimum. You pursue your projects, et cetera, et cetera, right? That would be the Aristotelian version of the happy life. What this, the, the, the word that we should use, uh, we should be using actually is the one that the ancient Greeks used, uh, regardless of which school they belong to, and that was eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is the life worth living. Okay. That seems very uh, circular. What's a happy life, a life worth living? Okay, what's a life worth living? Right, except that what breaks the circularity is that each one of those different schools had an actual conception of what counts as eudaimonic life and why. Lay it on us. Lay it on us, Massimo. Yeah. We're here so, to so let me give you three. Let me give you, actually, let me give you four, uh, including the stoic one, because that actually kind of gives, gives you um, a very, I think, I, I hope, a very clear uh, understanding of not only what the ancient Greeks and Romans thought, but actually how to think about uh, the happy life. So Aristotle thought that a happy life was a life of virtuous flourishing, 
Virtuous flourishing means uh, you want to act virtuously, meaning you want to be an ethical human being. And, however, you also do need, need, not just prefer, but need certain external things such as health, well, a little bit of wealth, a little bit of uh, education, a little bit of good looks and like uh, things like that. Otherwise, your life sucks. Even if you're virtuous, your life sucks. That's Aristotle. Uh, the Epicureans thought that the good life is actually defined by one thing and one thing only, and that is absence of pain. Okay. A good human life, no matter, you can, you can live your life in a number of different ways so long as it's painless, particularly in terms of emotional pain. Okay. So that's true. The cynics, the cynics were the in-your-face philosophers of antiquity, the, the people that you know, went in the streets and, and, and reminded people constantly how bad they, they, they were. And the cynics thought that the only thing that matters is virtue. What the, uh, health doesn't matter. Wealth doesn't matter. Possessions don't matter. That nothing else matters. The only thing about uh, what what makes a good human life is acting virtuously, acting what uh, uh, we would say today pro-socially, you know, engage with other people in a in a pro-social fashion. And then there is the Stoics. The Stoics kind of fall in between the Aristotelians and the Cynics. So the Stoics said, yes, the the overarching thing that is important, you know, the, the, the top thing that is important in life is to act ethically toward other people. Why? Because that's human nature. Human nature is the, the nature of a cooperative social being. Yes, we do nasty things to each other on occasion. Yes, we use violence. Yes, we cheat. Yes, we do all that. But those are actually negative aspects of human nature that get in the way of Social, social life. Fundamentally for the Stoics, we're essentially social beings and we depend on each other in a very interconnected fashion um, in order to have a good life. So the most important thing is in fact to act ethically toward other people. But it's okay to also pursue on the side, so to speak, uh, the kinds of things that Aristotle thought were absolutely necessary for life, such as wealth, health, health education, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because other things being equal, it's better to be healthy than sick, better to be wealthy than poor, better to be educated than ignorant and that sort of stuff. But the crucial difference with Aristotle is that the Stoics thought that even if you don't have any of those things, your life is still worth living. And the reason for that is because it is still in your power to do good in, 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 in life, to do good to other people, even if you are sick, even if you're poor, even if you are, you know, if your means are very limited. So let me give you an example of a good stoic life, even though the person that I'm about to mention was not actually a stoic. Um, Nelson Mandela. So we all know that Mandela spent, I forgot what it was, 18 years, I think, in prison during the apartheid regime. That's not flourishing. Aristotle would have said, sorry, dude, your life sucks, right? It's like, that is definitely not flourishing. So would the Epic Epicureans, yeah, exactly. they would have said. Epicureans would have said, ah, that's a lot of pain, my friend, the both physical and mental pain. So no, your life sucks as an Epicurean as well. But the Stoics would say, uh, hold on. Yes, of course, you, you're not flourishing. Of course, you're not, you know, you're not enjoying the, 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 the kinds of material life that other people might be enjoying. But you're doing something that is very worthwhile. You're fighting for a good cause. You're fighting for the improving the human condition. Uh, therefore, your life is worth living, even if you don't succeed. Because in the end, as we know, he actually succeeded in the end. But even if you don't succeed, Epictetus actually mentions uh, some people who lost their lives uh, in opposition to the emperors of Vespasian and Domitian, who the Stoics considered, uh, you know, tyrants. And Epictetus, in one of his students, at one point says, uh, well, that was a wasted life, right? What, what, what was the point of that? And Epictetus says, he gave the example. It was like the purple on the toga. The purple on the toga is the, is the, 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 the thing that actually makes you look at, at the, the whole garment and say, okay, that's interesting. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's well done, right? So a life like Nelson Mandela's, even if had, he had failed, it would have still, still been worthwhile because it would have set the example for others on, on, on what to do and how, and how to live your life. So all of these different conceptions are the result of different understandings of what's important about human nature. Right. So what breaks the circle that you brought up is that um, 
the, the, the claim is not just that the happy life is the life worth living. That would definitely be circular. That would definitely not, you know. Uh, the, 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 the idea is the happy life is the life worth living, and here it is, and here is how I cash it out and why. I like it. I I am worried and um thankful that we are revisiting ancient wisdom on modern wisdom uh, and generally kind of in the 21st century because it seems like so many of the things that people presume are going to make them happy have become hijacked. You know, like the Instagram TikTok 21st century transactional sex porn hub world of yep. uh, of um, the race to the bottom of the brainstem, which you'll be familiar with from evolutionary psychology, which is how a lot of the apps that people spend a lot of time on are getting them hooked. Uh, it, it really does feel like this is a little bit of an antidote to that. So hopefully that's opened some people's eyes to it. In terms of some strategies or your uh, favorite strategies en route to the happy life, we've got the dichotomy of control, which is, um, I would say perhaps more useful at avoiding suffering and pain than perhaps it is at pursuing happiness. I might have got that a little bit wrong, but that's at least how it seems to me. Um, if if you see pain as being in the way of happiness as opposed to it, it removes the, the negatives rather than adds the positives to me as far as that seems. I'm going to disagree with that on that, uh, with you on that one uh, a little bit. I mean, I can see why you say that uh, because, yes, one of, one of the major outcomes one of the major goals of the dichotomy of control is in fact to as a peter puts it do not get disturbed when events don't go your way right yep. uh so that's i can see where that comes from but at the same time there is also the positive you know the, the flip side of the coin is um you don't get disturbed the notion of not getting disturbed by but the fact that events don't always go your way that's because that's one side of the one half of the dichotomy of control it's because you're focusing on the things that you don't control right you say okay i don't control this so i shouldn't be worried about it i should activate i should actively cultivate a um, attitude of equanimity toward outcomes because i don't control the outcomes but that's only half of the dichotomy the other half is and i should be focusing my en energy and efforts on the stuff that i actually control now it turns out as we all realize there's a pretty damn co good correlation between your efforts and your outcomes, right? So let me go back to the initial example of the COVID infection, right? Um, while it is true that I don't control the outcome, that I could still get COVID no matter what I do and no matter how careful I am, it is also equally true that my chances of getting COVID go dramatically down because I'm doing all those kinds of things that, that, um, that I'm doing. Vice versa in terms of... Um, of positive outcomes because that would be a negative outcome obviously but in terms of positive outcomes i don't know if i am applying for a job for instance right uh yeah if i focus on the outcome which is actually getting the job i'm focusing on the wrong thing according to epictetus because that's not up to me that's up to whoever is interviewing me right however Focusing on the effort, putting together a resume, co focusing during the interview, dressing well, not going out drinking bef the night before the interview, you know, that all of that sort of stuff. Those are up to me. And those obviously raise significantly the chances that I will, in fact, get the job. Right. So so there is actually a positive aspect to it. Um, and it's essentially, uh, you know, we also mentioned this, this uh, bit on, on uh, 11 on section 11 of the book about going through life as a, as if you were in a, in a, in a, inn, you know, checking in a, in a, in a hotel. Um, there too, another analogy that the, the Stoics use is the um, seasonal, um, uh, un, uh, the seasonal uh, way of thinking. Uh, so Epictetus says, for instance, don't, don't wish for figs in winter. Wishing for figs in winter is hopeless because figs are not winter you know, they, they don't bloom in winter. They don't, they're not winter fruits. I can tell you, I'm a botanist. And um, on the other hand, don't wi not wishing in, for figs in winter, and it, when he, would, he applies this to, you know, missing your loved ones. If, if your parents died, for instance, as in my case, a few years ago, wish them to wish that they were here now is wishing for figs in winter. It's like, okay, I'm just making myself feeling bad because now I'm, now I'm, my mind is, on purpose going on in a direction where which is not not uh, it's not a productive one however they there was a season during which they were alive and well 
right? There was a summer there. And so the notion is that the, con- the, the, so the other side of the, of the coin, the flip side of the coin is, and when it's summer, you really should enjoy the things <laughs> because they are in season, right? So the, up, the, the, the upshot of this is that Stoics tend to concentrate on the focus on the here and now of what they have now. We try not to regret things that we no longer have because they're gone. We try not to hope too much for things to come because they're also not under my, my control. I mean, who knows what the hell is going to happen. But in the meantime, I can focus on what I have right here, right now. I have a good life. I'm healthy. I have a, a wife that loves me. I have a daughter that is uh, starting her life as an independent. All of the, I have friends. I, you know, they, there are all these things that eventually will be gone. At some point or another. But why the hell should I worry about the fact that they're going to be gone? When they're going to gone, they're gone. That's it. Okay, fine. End the story. That's how life works. But right now they're here. And so I need to pay attention to here now because too often we actually take people and things for granted. And we can also take ourselves out of the moment of enjoying the, sh- the brief time that we do have with those people and things, worrying about the time when they're not going to be here. And that's a yeah. surefire route to misery. That's yeah. like uh, the Mark Twain quote which is worrying is like playing a debt that you don't owe yes exactly that's exactly right mark twain had a little bit of a stoic <laughs> well good I mean, obviously i've done my research on mark so i i know that precisely yep. um in terms of one more lesson that you think you didn't need to change but would help people to lead a happy life what would it be number 30 uh, you're a social animal, and whether you like it or not, living in a society comes with certain duties. How do you figure out what these duties are? Just look at the various roles you play. So this is this comes out of what is uh, sometimes referred to as Ep- Epictetus' role ethics. Uh, there's a wonderful book about just about that uh, aspect of Stoicism or Epictetus' philosophy by Brian Johnson, who is a colleague of mine at uh, Fordham University, and he wrote a, a book on the role ethics of Epictetus. The notion that Epictetus put forth is that, like, look, what's your best guidance in life on how to actually live your life? Well, just ask yourself what kind of roles you normally play. And he, dis- he distinguished three types of roles that we all have in life. The first and most fundamental one is, of course, the member of the human cosmopolis. We are human beings, all of us, right? And since the Stoics were cosmopolitan, uh, the implication of that is that we should never do anything that undermines the, the human cosmopolis. What, do, what right. do you mean by cosmopolitan in, in this definition? Uh, considering every human being on earth as brothers and sisters. Cool. Right? So, which means you should never do anything that undermines the human cosmopolis. Now, whenever I say that, often people say, I, I can't, even if I wanted to, I can't undermine human cosmopolis. I don't have that kind of power, right? It's like, I'm not an emperor, I'm not a president of the United States. But that's not true. Uh, for instance, if um, if you live a, a, the kind of life that contributes to global warming, you are undermining the, 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 the human cosmopolis. If you live, if you shop, uh, let's say, for your daily life into places that are known to exploit other people, you're undermining the human cosmopolis. If you are eating uh, animals that have suffered unnecessarily, in order to be uh, served on your dinner plate, you are undermining the human cosmopolis. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways where you can actually undermine the human cosmopolis. So that's number one, the first, first role. The other two classes of roles are the, the types of roles that circumstances give you. You don't choose them. For instance, you know, you're somebody's son. Right? You didn't choose that. That was not your choice. You, that's, that's what it is. But now that you're there, you have some duties, you know. Uh, children have certain duties toward their parents. Uh, even if, Epictetus says, even if their parents are not good, they're, they're, you know, they're not the best parents you can. Because the deal that the universe gave you wasn't, I'm going to give you the best parents. The universe just said, I'm going to give you parents. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes you, it works out well, sometimes it doesn't. But the point is, your parents' behavior is not under your control. Your behavior is under your control. So you still have certain duties. Now, those duties don't expand to, you know, being abused physically or mentally by your parents. That's not, that's not a duty that you have. But you do have a duty to be forgiving, a duty to be helpful, et cetera, et cetera. And then the third class of duties, uh, of roles, sorry, sorry are the, the ones that we ch- choose given our circumstances. For instance, I'm a father. That was a choice. 
uh, I'm a friend to some people and, and that's another choice. Uh, my career was a choice to, to some extent and so on and so forth, right? My, obviously my relationship to my wife was a choice. All of those carry their own duties. Right? So if I put somebody in, into, the, into the world, then I have certain duties toward that person. I have to take care of that person. I have to you know, make sure that she has as many instruments as possible to actually live a fulfilling life. If I am in a relationship with my partner, that carries certain other duties. And again, those duties don't imply necessarily that the other person reciprocates or reciprocates on the same level. I mean, I'm lucky enough actually that you know my friends and relatives and 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 uh, 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 you know loved ones actually do tend to to re- reciprocate. But sometimes they, they won't. Sometimes they, they, that's not the case. And Epictetus says it doesn't matter because other people's behaviors is not under your control. And uh, Seneca says that when it comes to what the, the ancients called benefits, so being generous, giving, giving to other people, he says the, the, the thing to do is always to have your ledger such that you owe, you give more than you receive. Right? So don't look at what you're getting. Look at what you're doing, what you're giving. And of course, once again, this, the, the, the two are often connected right? without being Pollyannish about this kind of stuff. But look, if you're a generous person who actually genuinely loves other people and wants to be, that typically the people realize that and typically the people will give back precisely because, as the Stoics say, human beings tend to be social and highly pro, pro, you know, interactive and interdependent of each other. I think that we agree on something that other people got angry at me for talking about on a podcast a little while ago. And okay, try um, me. <laughs> can we just take a second to talk about how much bollocks is in the secret? Oh yes, a lot. <laughs> so the the cur- the best lies have a kernel of truth in them, right? And yeah. what you've just brought up there with the what you could quite easily call karma. Things come back around. Right. But there isn't some metaphysical, magnetized aura of nebulous, ephemeral, no. supercharged good teons, or whatever they were called in the, bo- in the secret. I was about to call it the bollocks there, but um, in, the, <laughs> <laughs> in the secret. Uh, and yet, because of that kernel of truth, it seduces people into believing it. Right. That's, that's exactly right. I mean, that's how a lot of pseudoscience works. That there is a kernel of truth, there is a kernel of plausibility, right? And people don't think too carefully about it. They also engage in all that wishful thinking. It's like, oh, that sounds good, so I want to believe it. I mean, you know, that, uh, that, that, uh, that's how the psychology of pseudoscience science actually works. But yeah, actually, I've used the secret as an example of a type of metaphysics that is entirely incompatible with stoicism because it violates the dichotomy of control. Essentially, it says that you do control the universe, that, that if you really want it, if you really make the effort, if you really are into certain things, the universe somehow will rearrange itself um, so to you know, favor uh, your, your goals. Epictetus, expli- without, who had not read, of, obviously, the, the secret. <laughs> Thank God for that. Right. Good he explicitly guy. says so to a, one of his students. Um, he says um, one of his students apparently came in complaining about the fact that his nose was, was running all the time. Right? So he's, he had a cold or something like that. And Epictetus says, okay, wipe your damn nose, but stop complaining about the fact that there are such a things as running noses in the universe. What do you want to do? The, the, he literally says, what would you want? The universe to rearrange yourself for the sake of your running nose? It's like, when I read that, I said, wait a minute, this guy must have read The, the secret. secret, yeah. Him and Rhonda Byrne would have fallen out. I remember, man, the, um, there was this story. Do you remember, it was about 2003, the big... Christmas Day su- or Boxing Day tsunami in Thailand, was it? Yeah. Uh, right, in East right. Asia. And Rhonda Byrne, author of The Secret, said the reason that the tsunami happened was because the people of East Asia were giving out bad energy that attracted the tsunami. Ah. Right. right. That's in, awful. In that what, in what awful. world is that acceptable to say? To, it, it, hundreds of thousands of people displaced from their homes and then some bourgeois writer sitting at the back of a couple of million sold copies of a book that is based on bullshit is able to say, oh, well, if only you'd been giving off some more positive vibes, then this tsunami wouldn't have come and annihilated the next generation. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm completely on board with, with, uh, with that. In fact, 
not only I think that metaphysics, remember we, we were discussing earlier that according to the Stoics, logic, metaphysics, and ethics are connected. Yeah, I love now, the um, Stoics, I love the field, I love the, the ring, the fence around the field analogy that you gave, I think right, it's exactly. very nice, yeah. Well, think about it in terms of the secret. They're connected in exactly the wrong way, right? Um, because the metaphysics is bullshit. I mean, the, the universe simply doesn't work that way. The logic is flawed because clearly you should be able to realize that the universe doesn't work that way and draw the right conclusions. And the ethics is horrible because it ends up blaming the victims, as in the case of the tsunami that you just brought up, right? So, oh, it's their fault. What do you mean it's their fault? Those people, are there is a, they are suffering. Some of them died as a result of a random natural event. And you are saying that it's their fault, essentially? What kind of monstrous ethics is that? It really is. Do so, you know what it is? Identifying the fact that it is the flipped reverse of the dichotomy of control. Uh, yeah. I mean, if ever there needed to be a nail in the coffin of the secret, <laughs> it could be right there. Do you know what it is as well? I had one of the guys on. Oh, I'm going to forget his name. I had one of the guys that featured in the film. The Secret, mm-hmm. um, really smart cognitive psychologist, understood what he was talking about, and he, it, it felt like was in it begrudgingly or perhaps for clout. And even him, this is a person who featured in the film very prominently, and even he had highlighted his own issues. Look, we we can continue bad mouthing the secret for the remainder of the episode, but I feel like we've we can we can just summarize it this way: the metaphysics is bullshit, the reasoning is bad, and the headaches is horrible. There we go. That's it. Job done. Um, <laughs> last lesson. Another one where you diverge from stoicism. Something else that you think would help people uh, lead a happy life. You talk about 50, you're talking about fifty-two, whichever you think. Oh, oh, oh! I thought I thought you literally thought the last lesson. No, no, a, a, a <laughs> final lesson from you, Massimo. Um, I think. Uh, let's see. There are there are several, of course, that are. Um, that are uh, interesting to me in that sense. But for instance, um, I tend to go back over and over on this notion of um, one thing that the, the, that is missing from the original Stoicism is an appreciation of what we would today call social justice. Right. And I don't mean as in social justice warriors or anything like that. I'm just mean the basic concept in philosophy of social justice, meaning that we should try to come up with a society that is as just as equanimous as possible, right? Stoicism doesn't have that, and it's not a fault necessarily because Stoicism is a personal philosophy. It's not meant to be a you know broad societal level kind of umbrella type of philosophy. For instance, when people accuse the Stoics, oh, but you don't have a theory of social justice or anything like that, well, would you ever accuse Christians or Buddhists of the same? Buddhism doesn't have a theory of social justice, neither does Christianity, because those are personal philosophies. They tell you how you should behave, not how other people should behave. However, it is still the case that uh, the ancient Stoics started moving in that direction, and I think that it behooves us to keep moving along the same trajectory. Let me give you two examples. The Stoics were, uh, the ancient Stoics I'm talking, were fairly unusual in the ancient world because they thought that women are have the same mental abilities as men and therefore they actually ought to study philosophy and practice the virtuous life right seneca says that explicitly uh epictetus said that explicitly they're, 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 it's there okay but of course they were not what we would call feminists uh you know in modern terms i mean they were you know seneca in fact on the one hand, says this kind of stuff very explicitly. There's no, there's no, this is not even implied. This is he actually says so explicitly in uh, a letter of consolation that he writes to his uh, friend Marsha, who had lost an adult son. Uh, at some point, he, he says, you know, you you think that I'm talking out of, of uh, steps here because you're a woman, but in fact, women have the same ability as men. They should be, et cetera, et cetera. So he actually says that. But then, you know, like a few paragraphs later, he says, you know, don't be womanish. Don't be, you know, it's like, so he was not, not to her, actually, in a different letter. He said, don't be womanish. Like, what, what do you mean? Hey, what, hold on a second here. So Seneca and the Stoics moved in, the, started moving in that direction. But of course, they were naturally a product of their own culture and time. And this, these were people that lived 2,000 years ago in an incredibly misogynist society by, by modern standards, right? 
So modern Stoics can pick up on that. And there are actually a couple of scholars who have written technical papers about the relationship between Stoicism and feminism, for instance. Feminism here understood very simply and very broadly. I'm not talking about specific waves or specific, you know, uh, current ongoing controversies. I'm simply talking about the basic notion that women are human beings just as men. And therefore, they ought to have the same rights and, and et cetera. As you know. That's it. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, so there is more modern scholarship that moves us in that direction. It's, and argues, and I agree, that feminism in that bare bone sense that I just mentioned is actually logically entailed by Stoic philosophy. And so that a Stoic should be feminist. It's inconsistent to, for somebody to be a Stoic and not, not being a feminist. The second example has, has to do with the environment. So the ancient Stoics were not, of course, conscious of the value of the environment in, which, in the way in which we are, right? In fact, explicitly, they thought that what we call the environment, particularly other animals and plants, are there for our consumption. They're, they're there because, you know, the logos of the universe set it up in a way that that's what we're going to do with it. However, they did have this notion of the expanding circles of concern. One of the uh, second century Stoics, his name was Hier Hierocles said that we should try to practice this these notion of, of expanding our concern. We're naturally concerned about ourselves. That comes natural to a human being, right? It's the self. But then it also comes pretty natural immediately early on in our lives to be concerned with our caretakers, you know, typically our parents. And then we expand that kind of concern to other family members and friends. And then he said we should make an effort to expand that kind of concern to further and further circles out there, citizens of their same city, citizens of the same country, and eventually humanity at large, right? Well, today, some scholars, modern scholars in Stoicism, like Chris Gill, for instance, uh, say, yeah, and there is one more step. <laughs> and then one more, in fact, a couple more steps. The, the immediate of, of the step after that is other sentient animals. Because, why? Because they suffer, because they're capable of suffering. And then after that, sort of the environment as a whole, but not in any kind of, again, Pollyannish or sort of Gaia kind of sense in spooky, which, oh, well, wishy-washy yeah, energy spooky, stuff. Wish yeah. Yeah. No, just because we, the, we depend on a health environment uh, to, as human beings to live. So it's, it's up to us. It's the same version. It's an expanded version of the same concept that the Stoics have, uh, but, which is one of the things that I, uh, one of the reasons why I really like Stoicism we tend today to make a sharp distinction between self and and uh, self regard, you know, and uh, and other regard, right? So you, if you're an altruist, you're doing something that sacrifices yourself to, for for the sake of another. The Stoics didn't see it that way. The Stoics thought that whenever you help other people, you're actually helping yourself because you're making yourself a better person. And whenever you're working on becoming a better person, you're automatically helping other people because that's, you know, that's, that's the way your interactions are going to go. And so similarly, they wouldn't see, I think, a sharp distinction today with modern scientific knowledge between ourselves and the environment. Of course, you want to safeguard the environment because our own damn survival depends on it. Our ability to flourish depends on it. The reason you want good air and good wa quality water for everybody is because that's how you, you live a good life. Otherwise, you're going to literally poison yourself. So you should, you should be concerned with it. So those are some of the things that also that I, uh, exp I it's not, not as much as a disagreement with Epictetus as much as an expansion of Epictetus concerns. I think that it's really interesting to hear the way that you can synthesize new world information, you know, and, and, and adapt it to ancient wisdom. I really uh, am intrigued by what you said at the very beginning that I, it hadn't come to me that Stoicism had this, you know, half millennia or so to develop and then very quickly got neutered by the new kid on the block, which was Christianity right. for about a thousand years and then came yeah. back Renaissance, then really sort of kicked on enlightenment, then stopped again. And now People like yourself and Ryan Holiday, so on and so forth, are repopularizing it. Um, but I wonder, I wonder what we would have if Stoicism had been allowed to continue unfettered, or even a couple of schools of it, you know, had been able to keep going for fifteen hundred years. It would have been very interesting. Yeah, we would have something similar to modern Buddhism, 
uh, we would have a number of schools of thought. Some of them would put would probably have developed certain strands of ancient thought into new directions, and others would have picked up on other strands. And some of them might even become incompatible. I mean, there are some versions of modern Buddhism that you could argue are actually incompatible with each other, uh, even though they all come from the same root. Their emphasis, their development has been such that they are actually not compatible. And that's great because that means that there is more variation, you know, there is more to pick from in terms of when you're thinking about your philosophy of life. You say, okay, well, that there's different ways of thinking about this stuff. And, you know, let me see which one uh, actually resonates with me and which one is actually useful to me. Yeah, the, I really love that quote. And I'd written it down and then you said it, so I, cu I couldn't say it. Uh, those who have advanced these doctrines before us are not our masters, but our guides from Seneca. And with that as well is a lovely way to kind of remind us all that the vast majority of what I spend my time thinking about and talking about on this show, which is how to lead a good life and how to be virtuous and be happy and be feel fulfilled, is an ongoing process. There is wisdom of the past that we can take in and think, oh my God, this is, there's so much of the work has been done already, but there's a massive amount of imposter syndrome uh, or over uh, over respect, I guess, for the sages of the past to presume that there's no more right. work to be done on top of that. So the Stoic Guide to a Happy Life will be linked in the show notes below. If you've enjoyed today, I highly, highly recommend that you go and check it out. Very easy book to read. What we are, 150 pages, pocket-sized, your vade mecum to take with you. Uh, anywhere else that people should go and check out, Massimo? Well, if anybody's interested in pretty much everything I do from podcasting to writing essays and books, uh, they can go to MassimoPiliucci.com. I imagine that was a very easy URL to get. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no one else competing for that. Massimo. It's a little bit more difficult to spell, but it's... it's It'll still... be linked. There's a link in the show notes below. Do not, <laughs> I implore you, you will lose brain cells trying to write it yourself. Just click the link below. It's been a pleasure to have you on twice in 2020, mate. I'm looking forward to the next time. So do I. Thank you. Thank you.